Welcome to this special webcast on inland education. I'm Duane Gang from the Press Enterprise and PE.com. Businesses find a lot to like about inland Southern California. Inexpensive land and proximity to freeways, train routes, and ports. But finding the skilled workers they need is another matter altogether. In many cases, businesses simply can't find highly educated or specially trained staff. The numbers alone are daunting. More than 27,000 students in Riverside and San Bernardino counties dropped out of the class of 2010. 21% of residents have a, do not have a high school diploma, a number higher than both the state and national average. And even when students graduate, many are unprepared for college. Less than a third of local graduates meet the admission requirements for the University of California and Cal State systems. So what can be done about it? How can the region, from educators, business leaders, and parents, boost those high school graduation rates? How can the region better be prepared prepare its youth for jobs of the 21st century? What are businesses even looking for in that next generation of worker? Our panel will discuss. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let me introduce our guests. Uh, Susan Mills, you're principal at Ramona High School here in Riverside. You've been there for the last five years, and you're a 34-year veteran of the Riverside Unified School District. Uh, Jay Westover, you're a consultant with Innovate Ed, a company that works with uh, school districts around the state and nation on ways to improve um, education and academic performance. Uh, Paul Granillo, you're president and CEO of the Inland, economic, In Inland Empire Economic Partnership, uh, a group that works with uh, business leaders and works with local governments to try to improve quality life and economic development in the region. And Janet Zimmerman, one of our Press Enterprise reporters, she was part of the team that produced uh, the four-part special report on inland education. So thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, so let's, Janet, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about the project and some of the paper's findings as you reported on inland education. Um, well, this project has actually been in the works for quite a while. In June, our editor, Maria Deverine, uh, assigned seven reporters and three editors to look into this connection between education and the economy. And we, we already knew the inland uh, statistics were pretty dismal. Uh, in, in Riverside County, 16, a little over 16% of students drop out of high school. In San Bernardino County, that rate's over 21%, which is higher than the statewide average of 18.2%. So we knew that going in, and, and our task was to find out why and what could be done about it. So really, the causes are three-pronged, according to the people that we talked to. Um, Proposition 13 was passed in 1978 that limited um, property tax revenue to schools, and it also shifted control to the state. The second prong was uh, a 1990 influx of people coming, looking for uh, cheap real estate, basically. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, lower income families, and it was a lot of English language learners, and, and both of those correlate with a lower educational attainment. And um, third, the global economy, or the economy has shifted to more knowledge-based global, um, the, the has put us in competition with countries that before didn't have a high go college going rate. And so all of those things have uh, changed the picture. Right, right. Uh, Paul, let me, let me turn to you next. Um, what, are, what are businesses here looking for? What are, are some of the skills unique to inland businesses that, are, that, are, that they need? Or I mean, what are the, what are the 21st century skills that, that workers and businesses are looking for? Sure, it's a good question. I think we have to look at who the Inland Empire is. Riverside and San Bernardino counties, our biggest sectors in business are still blue collar sectors. Mm -hmm. And if we're ever going to go beyond that, um, we have to make sure that those blue collar sectors are strong, that the sons and daughters of those blue collar workers um, are well educated. And in turn, they will be, be the workforce of the future. So when we look at manufacturing, when you look at logistics, and those are two major sectors, the two, the two largest sectors in our economy, it used to be construction, mm -hmm. and it's not, it won't be for a while. Uh, the, the economy of today is, in, in those areas, is much more advanced. And so what 
they, they, they are looking for is a specialized type of training. Really, you have to understand computers. You really have to understand a, a, a higher level of mathematics if, if you're going to work in those sectors. So even if people see, oh, it's a warehouse or it's a shipping business, you know, I can, any, anybody can do that. What you're really talking about is even those workers now require a higher level of skill and expertise and training. Yeah. In the Inland Empire, we have one of the best examples of that in the new Skechers plant in mm -hmm. Moreno Valley. Um, it's a two million square foot building. But what's really impressive about it is what's inside. And basically inside, it's a big robot. So you need to be at the top of your class at ITT Tech just mm -hmm. to start working in there. There's no forklift, there's no jobs uh, driving a forklift in there. Everything has been, um, is, is done by robotics. But if you're at the top of your class at ITT Tech and you get that job, you're probably making $65,000 a year. And from that level all the way up is what they need at Skechers. Mm -hmm. Jay, let me, let me turn to you. Um, you heard some of those numbers. You know, I think it's one in five students in San Bernardino County, one in six here in Riverside County drop out of high school. Uh, is the region meeting the needs that, that Paul talked about? I would say not. Um, for probably the past 10 years, we've seen that because of No Child Left Behind and, and a focus on getting students proficient, we've seen that schools, you know, just because what they're expected to do, are, are helping ensure students are highly tested and, and are proficient. I think we've got lost the focus of what type of student do we need to prepare and what does that student need to look like when they graduate. And so there's been a transition to the reality that a student who graduates high school may not be prepared for the demands of what they have to do after high school, mm -hmm. where I would say that because of No Child Left Behind and other initiatives, we are now realizing that a highly tested proficient student does not equate to a student who's prepared for the workforce or, or for college. Mm -hmm. So I would say that with that knowledge, we're seeing that uh, schools and districts are transitioning from a proficient student to a student who's truly prepared. So the system needs to change to right. allow that. You know, uh, Susan, he, he, Jay talked about, you know, preparing uh, individuals and students for college. Your principal at Ramona. Uh, what are, what are, you know, not everyone, graduating from high school is one thing, graduating from high school and being prepared for college is another. What are, what are some of the challenges that, that you see in your experience and, you know, maybe some of the factors contributing to why some students really aren't prepared for college even though they do get that high school diploma? Well, <clears throat> um, with agreeing with Jay, one of the things that we've done is that I think we've lowered our expectations when we focused on the high school exit exam, looking at proficiency rate as opposed to looking at what kids need to do to go to college to be career, to have a career and a college, um, uh, to be proficient and, and go to college. We've lowered our expectations. So I think that we have kids who come to school who um, we don't have a rigorous um, curriculum and mm -hmm. it's not relevant. So um, what are we doing in our curriculum to make it relevant for the students so that they see the Skechers plant as a reality, that they see that the math that they would do in the Skechers plant is something. So what career technical kinds of things are we offering to meet their needs? Where do they see their progress and their plan for a career in the school mm -hmm. when they're just taking algebra? Right. And in going back to the, the high school graduation rates, what are some of the factors that you are seeing or what some of the challenges that you face in terms of keeping kids in school and getting them to graduate? Well, it's, it's complex because I don't want to use them as excuses. Um, they're, they're just challenges. I think one of the biggest challenges is getting kids to come to school and getting um, parents to help them come to school. Uh, that that's a, a difficulty in high school mm -hmm. but my belief is that if we are offering a program to meet their needs that they'll come to school more often right All right Jenna let me let me turn to you I mean the the numbers can look overwhelming sometimes uh, so what can be done about it how can can schools and, and businesses you know help students succeed in your reporting what are some of the things that you found that schools are doing uh, to help improve their, their college and, and or high school graduation and college going rates? There actually are a lot of effective programs underway. Um, AVID is one of them. Susan has a very large AVID program at her school. Uh, that stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. It's a program that gets 
at-risk kids, those kids in the middle, you know, not A students, and, and prepares them and shows them how to get to college. And, and they're often the first ones in their family um, to go to, to, to get a higher education. Um, a lot of these programs address the issues of poverty, um, cultural and language barriers. Um, another issue is relevance, and, and you touched on this, and, and making, making education relevant to students. Um, uh, the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools program, it's called Alliance for Education, um, brings in business leaders and conducts lessons for kids, real, show, showing them real life applications right. for, for trigonometry, uh, geometry, algebra, all those things that they're learning in class and not sure they'll ever use in the real world. And that's very important. Right. Uh, Susan, uh, Janet mentioned AVID and some of the programs at uh, Ramona. What, uh, tell us, have you had some success with, with AVID and, and some of your other efforts underway? Yes, a AVID is actually, uh, this AVID program is the largest uh, AVID program in the United States. There's 505 students mm -hmm. in the program. And 99.9% um, .9 of those students uh, go to um, a two or four year, most of them a four year university, and most of them on scholarships. So it's obviously a program that has mentor, they have mentors. Every Friday a speaker comes in from um, a different career um, or a college. Um, they, they actually take their path that they're going to go and they actually write it down. Which class am I going to take? Which year? And they're mentored by other AVID students, the seniors who mentor the ninth graders. Mm -hmm. It's been very successful. We have a health and science academy where the students are job shadowing all f uh, two, two years of the program. And they actually have some internships in some health clinics in Riverside. So they, that makes it relevant when they can see where their path is. Right. You know, Jay, many districts are under kind of severe financial pressures mm -hmm. right now with the economy. Um, California uh, ranks last nationwide in the ratio of students to each librarian, for example. But is this all about money, or is it, uh, can, can you develop effective programs even during these tough economic times? I think it comes down to school culture. Um, as, as we look at high-performing schools and we go inside, it's really about the work that the, the staff and the administrators really want for their students. So I, I, I've come to realize that we have to redefine what does an at-risk student look like and then have the school embrace and support the students differently. Um, and it's not that schools haven't been working hard. Um, we like to think of it as integrated systems as student support. Mm -hmm. As we build the culture, we identify students at risk early, we intervene and give them support and, and do things such as AVID, then it doesn't cost money. It's just how we conduct ourselves and how we provide support for students. Um, I think you'll find that those highest achieving school districts tend to be those that don't have a lot of categorical funds. And the schools that you would call them 90, 90, 90 schools that are high poverty, um, a lot of free reduced lunch students, it's not that they're using a tremendous amount of funds, it's that they're deciding on a different type of school culture. So schools like Susan's, who, who embrace programs that really don't necessarily cost more money all, changes the culture of the school and changes how they want to uh, support students. You know, some, some school, high schools in our districts are even experimenting with you know, kind of reducing the size of those high schools uh, to make, is, is that something that can be done to kind of be a little bit more it, it intimate is. with So students? the idea of small learning communities, right. if we have high schools that create houses, some of them will actually have a, a ninth grade house. And so the ninth graders have a different support system because we know ninth grade is the highest at risk grade level in high schools. And then they may connect it to some career paths. So students in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade may be supported by the same group of teachers but they build those relationships and they have support structures and they, they tend to see a same group of students and a similar group of teachers. So in a school, uh, an average size might be 2,000 to 3,000 students in a high school, which is you know, a massive amount mm -hmm. of students. Building those relationships with the kids is so important. And that, that also comes down to school culture because not all schools would want to do that because it's right. a really significant shift in, in how they would do business. Right. Susan, how do you develop that college-going culture? I mean, how should 
should high schools be aligning their, here in California, aligning some of their curriculum with what you see in, in Cal State, for example, are looking for? Well, actually, we're in the middle of doing that right now. We first look at the different kind of attributes that a college-going student needs to have and talk about that with our staff. And we look at our students and see which one of those attributes we think uh, we should be working on as a staff. We're working on that right now. The second thing that we look at is our students in 11th grade take an early assessment program test that looks and sees are they ready for college classes and we get those results back this summer and we put kids in 12th grade classes according to how they performed on that test um, <clears throat> and what what we did is we put them in classes to get them extra help before they go into college so th those are some of the things that we're working on right uh, Paul let me let me turn to you you talked a lot about um, the types of skills and, and, and things that that businesses here in the Inland Empire looking for. Uh, how, how important are, are, are teaching the trades, you know, in, in, in getting kids and students that foundation maybe in a trade or in science and technology? Um, well, if, if they have those skills, are they going to be more attractive to an employer? Sure. And, and I think the question is more than just the trades. Right. I think the question is the new world economy. And so we have to look at the world's economy. We have to look at where business is and, and, and then see where the trades fit and where advanced, uh, advanced degrees in education fit. And the answer is they're all part of the new economy. Um, unfortunately, the trades have kind of been forgotten. You know, when I was in high school, um, shop class was a good thing. And, and, and I'm happy that I took it because they're still skills that I learned that I can use in the garage every day. Um, and yet that also offered a path to, uh, for, for people into the middle class. And somehow we forgot about that. Um, you know, that used to be a, a big role of what was then called the junior colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet I think we forgot that this is also an important part of our economy. And so I think looking at the trade, some of the work that uh, was highlighted that uh, Mike Gallo is doing at Kelly Space and Technology, that's incredibly important. But he shouldn't have had to start it himself. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact of the matter was he couldn't find the properly trained people. And he's been able to turn things around and provide 300 jobs. So what you're saying is even, even a technical certification or or a technical certificate in a, in a trade or even an associate's degree in a specific field, um, that's, that's really important as well. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, really high-paid people in the CIA right now that never took a class. But what they have is the ability to use computers. Mm -hmm. And so we have, to, we have to appreciate that, too, that there's a, the ability of individuals to learn now because of uh, the types of technology that we come in contact with um, has really changed the equation. Jay, let me turn to you. Science, technology, engineering, math, STEM as it's called. We've heard a lot about its importance. You know, um, what is it and really how important is it to um, incorporate into high school curriculum? Well, I think it's vital and uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is application. So, so students will take science classes and math classes, but, but how are they given opportunities to really apply what they've learned in the classroom, whether it be from a, a career technical standpoint or just in a normal classroom. So when, when students realize that most of what we do in the United States is the application of science and math and engineering, students sometimes are in courses where they're learning formulas and they're learning standards, but are they really understanding that how these skills can be applied to some really exciting job opportunities? And so if we were able to have students in middle school understand all of these wonderful career paths and, and how they can apply the learning, then high school becomes different because now high school really is a path for students to achieve a career, to move towards one of these you know, very exciting job opportunities that they could. But what often happens is students come into high school, they kind of get lost, they don't have a plan, because if they you know, had a focus of something like STEM, we'd have a highly engaged student who's learning to apply things in the classroom, connecting to some form of post-secondary or career path, and those students, you couldn't keep them away from school. I mean, the idea of a dropout you know, for most students would, wouldn't even be a thought in their mind. So, so STEM is a great way to connect students to 
what is, what is the reason why I go to high school? And then most importantly, we don't just end when we graduate high school. We don't walk across the stage and it's over. We have to transition somewhere. And way too many students believe the end is my senior year. If we can help them extend that and see that it's not the end, it's the beginning, uh, then we have a highly engaged student and STEM's a great way to do that. Right? Dwayne, I, I did want to point out that, that STEM emphasis is being driven all the way down to the younger grades. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a STEM Academy, Riverside Unified School District has a STEM Academy that starts in fifth grade. So they're, they're starting that emphasis at a very young age. Uh, Susan, in how important is it, it are the, 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 the trades or even, you know, teaching those technical and voc vocational skills at the high school level? Very important. Um, but I also believe that <clears throat> when he was talking in the beginning about this global economy that we need to be teaching students, um, they're going to be going into highly technical jobs. So. We, we need to make sure that the CTE classes, the career and technical classes, are rigorous and that they're also aligned with the jobs of the future. I wanted to share something about <coughs> careers. Um, we, through our CLIP grant, every student is going to be able to go on to a career exploration website, Career Cruising, and every student right now is going to be able to put their plan, their resume, all the things that they would do to apply to college on a website. And so since we have like 600 to 1 students with a counselor now, in the old days we had like 300. As a school, what we're doing is once a month, school-wide, we have like an assembly, but we won't have a real assembly. They'll be meeting in with their teacher and on their device go in to this website and every student will take four different surveys to find out what is their career that they're interested in and they take and we don't do that enough of this with kids mm -hmm. and that gets to the relevance part and we've already done this piloted with a couple classes and kids find out you know wow I, I could be a park ranger I, I could be this and then on the website it actually has videos interviewing people that are in that job where you can go to college or a career technical school to get the education, how much it costs, mm -hmm. how much they make for a living, you know, all kinds of things that we currently don't do with every student in our school. We do them in the AVID program, we do them in the HBA, and so to have this opportunity and doing it eight times during the year each month with the student mm -hmm is like having um, an opportunity for these kids to really make it a plan. So they start in ninth grade and they keep it every year and it's web-based, so they build on it. They learn how to write their letter to the college, keep their resume. Right. I really think that helps be relevant because mm -hmm. then they think, oh, I need this class, I'm going to take this class. And then it also has incredible resources right. that the school doesn't have access to. We, we've talked uh, uh, somewhat here a little bit about technology. And speaking of technology, we just, <laughs> we just got a question in uh, via Twitter. Um, and this is, uh, and I'll let anyone jump in with this, but it relates to kind of the trades in, in Votech. And the, and the person asks, how can we reject the false dichotomy between trades preparation and the humanities and civic education? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> I, I, I guess, I mean, is, is it an either or, or? Or are the humanities, along with some of those, those trade and Votech, uh, just as equally as important? Well, again, going back to where the economy is, I think they're, they're both important. Um, I think the, the, the question is more of an internal debate that goes on in education, uh, that has gone, in and, uh, gone on in education. Uh, the example of the community colleges, I think, would would, would be a proof of, of, of that because that was out of a debate that whether or not what what is the direction, what is the purpose of the community colleges. So, again, I think we have to look at uh, at the reality of where we are. And the well-rounded person, um, I think, is important. And an education is the key to that. Uh, education opens all kinds of doors for people. And yet we have to recognize that certain people have talents and that those specialized talents in the trades, be they computer, be they working with um, you know, very, very precise machinery, uh, that's also a talent that people, if they have that talent, they should share it. How, and this is, uh, both, yeah, it, go ahead. 
I don't, and, and I don't think it's about one or the other. I think it's about students being informed and having the opportunity to choose, and 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 actually being having it in their schedule that they take music, and that they also take some career tech or some technology classes. So that it's not it's not one or the other. They need to have both, and then have the option of uh, being able when they graduate to go on if they can and have that grade point average. And, ha and graduate and know what their options are. Right, right. How, how important is it trying to identify maybe a student's strengths and maybe a student's interests in kind of tailoring some of that, their, their study and their curriculum to maybe that specific interest? And then maybe, you know, Susan, you can address that. And then Paul, I mean, how important is it for, you know, businesses to maybe get kids interested in a specific field while they're in, still in high school? You know, Susan? Well, I know in the past that it was about what your mom or dad told you you were going to be interested <laughs> in, or about what your counselor had somebody coming in to talk to you about, or maybe that teacher that motivated you and you ended up wanting to be a history teacher. And I think with our economy the way it is, I think that, that this career cruising a website, um, this opportunity for kids to really explore and go on and fill out these surveys. This is what I like to do. I like to be outside. I like to work on uh, cars. I like to do, and, and it really tailors to them what, what they, so I think we are at a point where we need to use technology as a tool to find out what we're interested in. And then at school, we can use that as a school actually to have a meaningful kind of career day, not just where we have a bunch of CB speakers. We know these kids are interested in this and this, and start connecting them and mentoring them with somebody in the community. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Paul, how is it important for businesses to be out there getting maybe high school students excited about what they provide and what they do as a business to maybe say, hey, look, this would be a really good career for you? Sure, absolutely. And, and the business perspective, I think, takes us back up to the 20,000 foot level. We have to appreciate that, uh, you know, businesses, um, they're trying to, to, to make a profit. They're trying to make sure they pay their, employ their employees. Um, that's what business does. But business also then uh, needs to make sure that the employees that it, it, that it takes on um, are the best trained that, uh, that they can get. And so if you look at the Inland Empire, uh, if you look at how business is involved in this issue of education, I mean, that's, that's a proof. What's going on in, in the Inland Empire is if, if we don't change things, um, we are going to live with same, some of the same statistics um, for a generation. Um, the list that Janet gave earlier for you know, the influx of people that came to the Inland Empire looking for a, a bigger house, it's true. But we also, the one that I would add to it is, in California, we've also done a great, da done great damage to the manufacturing sector. And so some of the jobs that, that people in the Inland Empire would take have been lost. And we, we need to also deal with that. If you look at initiatives like the Alliance for Education, IEP, we are made up of major businesses in the Inland Empire, major cities. Um, we have a partnership with the Community Foundation, which is helping us to attack quality of life issues. But number one amongst the quality of life issues across the board with big business and our, our cities, um, the issue of education is the number one quality of life issue that we're trying to tackle with our initiative with FACE, which is bringing together education leaders from across the two counties. And, and people are are supporting it wholeheartedly because they understand if we don't get this right, um, we're, we're, we're stuck. And so we need to, and, and business, I think, business taking the lead and, and helping us to break down a lot of barriers that bureaucracy puts in the way um, is, is key to that. Right. To, go ahead, Jay. So I was gonna say that um, from a K through 12 perspective, that we're seeing that project-based learning opportunities and really some simple ways that in the classroom, it doesn't have to be a CTE class, but in our regular classrooms, if we just provide opportunities for students to engage in some of that relevant and rigorous learning opportunities, we can not just build schools that has very structured career paths into current sectors, but it's very easy for teachers to take on that project-based learning opportunities in, in, in even in Algebra two and in, in statistics in higher level English classes. 
So I think we just need to begin to think about what does learning need to look like in the classroom and how do we bring in the STEM and bring in the businesses and not have to create these sometimes difficult structures and redesign schools, but how do we just focus on the learning environment in the classroom? And if we just do that, then we win. Mm -hmm. But we just have to you know, provide that support to understand what that learning environment can look like. Right. We had another uh, question, you know, is it also about you know, maybe learning outside of the classroom. We had a question from, from email uh, and asking, isn't the loss of funding for museums and symphonies and other things like that also, you know, causing education to suffer? This is a question that came in uh, via email. Uh, well, I, 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 I see a, some districts are, are looking at virtual field trips. So there's a district that um, I think in Orange, Orange County, um, I think it's uh, Capistrano School District, that they've started some uh, ways in which they're partnering with like the National Park System. So they're able to bring in through interactive video conferencing some of these virtual types of field trips and more interactive so that rather than looking at field trips and students and having some go, you can have it so all students can have an opportunity to have that interface. Now it's not, you know, you're not there physically touching it, but if we use technology in a smart way, I think we can open the world to our students because they're already technology savvy uh, and maybe using technology towards the advantage of what we do in our classrooms can open doors beyond what we ever anticipated. Right, right. Well, we have a lot more to talk about, but we will um, take a short break and we'll be right back with more about inland education and ways that can, it can be improved. We are your breaking news leader. News happens. Stay up to date with expanded coverage in the press enterprise delivered to your home. Follow the story throughout the day on PE.com. Receive news updates in your inbox or on your mobile device. That is how we keep you connected to your community. The press enterprise and PE.com. For home delivery, call 1-800-794-NEWS. The turn changes everything. The turn will make you think, make you re-examine your approach, change your line, innovate, and create one of the world's fastest reacting suspensions. Reading the road 1,000 times per second. It's the turn that leads you somewhere new. Introducing the new 2011 CTS V Coupe from Cadillac, the new standard of the world. Hi, I'm Alicia Renna from Bars Furniture, family owned and operated since 1963. We are featuring fantastic deals from Lazy Boy. The Lazy Boy Rocker Recliner has a three position footrest, 18 position ratchet, and two wing nuts so you can control how hard or how easy the back reclines. We also have a large selection of Lazy Boy sofas, love seats, and sleepers on sale and for immediate delivery. So come home to Bars Furniture and our design stuff will fit you in the perfect Lazy Boy Recliner. We are located at 5664 Mission Boulevard in Riverside. We cover the issues you care about. Here at the Press Enterprise and PE.com, local news matters whether you live along Route 66 or on Main Street. We provide regional analysis and in-depth investigation of issues like education, transportation, the environment, and much more. Important matters are covered here. That is how we keep you connected to your community. The Press Enterprise and PE.com. For home delivery, call 1-800-794-NEWS. Welcome to Paradise Chevrolet Cadillac. 
the number one volume dealership in Riverside and San Diego counties. It's the Chevrolet season of doing. Get behind the wheel of a select new 2011 Chevy model and take advantage of 0% APR financing plus $1,000 in bonus cash. Go for the rugged 2011 Avalanche or Colorado, the rough and tumble Silverado, or even a suburban Tahoe or Traverse model. Hurry into Paradise Chevrolet Cadillac today. We're conveniently located at 27360 Inez Road between Winchester and Rancho California Road in Temecula. Welcome back. I'm Dwayne Gang from the Press Enterprise and PE.com. We're discussing inland education and ways that it can be improved and how it can help uh, improve the local economy. Uh, we've, we've talked a lot about college and a lot about high school uh, graduation rates, but for many, once they get to high school, it you know, might be too late. They don't have that foundation. Uh, Janet, in the course of reporting this project, how often did you... Um, kind of come up with uh, and, and, and hear about people saying, look, you really have to get an early start on a child's education. This, this came up repeatedly in interviews that um, there, there's one, one fact that stuck in my mind and it's the relationship of uh, third grade reading level to future success. And um, in April there was a Casey Foundation study that showed um, children who are not proficient in reading by third grade are four times more likely to drop out when compared to their pro compared to proficient mm -hmm. readers and that's that's pretty shocking it starts at a very early age and and they're pushing hard on the literacy issue that's like the first right. benchmark you know Jay uh, we've heard a lot also about early assessment programs um, can you kind of explain what those are and, and how important they are so the, the one that's most well known now is the EAP, the Early System Program, that's in 11th grade. It's part of our STAR assessment. So students who take 11th grade English take a few more questions in an essay. And it's known nationally uh, as probably one of the best college and career assessments in the United States. So that results then, when you look at the data, pretty much is identical to what we see as far as students going to college and their persistence. In 11th grade, it's a little bit more difficult for that assessment because it's Algebra 2 and not all of our students get to the Algebra 2 level by 11th grade or higher. And it's another good indicator. It really points to what Susan mentioned was senior year needs to become a year in which students are building those skills needed for remediation. Um, other ones though, and I'd like to just connect to what Janet mentioned, is that third grade literacy is so important. If parents, from a perspective, understood some of these leading indicators, then, then they might realize that, and some do, I'm sure, we build prisons in the United States based upon one indicator, third grade literacy, because we know there's a really strong incarceration connection to that. So, so helping kids be literate by the time they're third grade, reading to them. Fifth grade is when they build the foundational math facts needed for algebra. So if students don't have the foundational facts of math, use of numeracy by fifth grade, then the likelihood of them getting an algebra is pretty low. By the end of eighth grade, a pretty staggering statistic uh, from ACT is that if the students don't have the ability to engage in a rigorous high school curriculum, then high school really doesn't matter for those students because they, they can't be successful. So, so we know that third grade, fifth grade, and by the end of eighth grade are really strong indicators uh, as to whether or not a student can even access a rigorous curriculum. And when they can't access it, they fail, they aren't successful, they stop coming, and then, you know, for them, they aren't even thinking about what's going to happen after right. high school. Uh, Susan, you're a, a high school principal, but you've also been principal at other levels uh, here in, in Riverside. What, in your view, does, what are the skills that, the minimum skills that every ninth grade student needs to have at, when they enter high school in order to be successful? Well, <laughs> That's, that's in a book about this big, <laughs> <laughs> that um, are, are the skills. Um, you know, they need to be writing, uh, you know, in, in sixth, and sixth grade, they need to be writing five paragraph essays. So um, when they come in in ninth grade, do we have every kid who can write at sixth grade level? Uh, not all kids can. And so can kids write um, at a certain level? that are in the, the standards and can kids um, pass algebra in seventh grade or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, we have kids who are in ninth grade who are taking algebra possibly for their third time. 
and what are we doing to motivate them? How motivating is it to take algebra from the same book right. for the third time? Right. Do even, Susan, do even the little things matter? Uh, I, I've read about a lot about just making sure kids show up for school. I mean, do those little things really um, go a long way? It, it makes a big difference. I think, I think that Jay was talking about the culture. Does the school expect you to show up on time? Is it, are you there first period? Do you show up for third period so you can be there just for lunch with your, with your friends? Do you have some kind of system where there's some punishment and reward mm -hmm. for good attendance? You know, all those things are important. But, you know, when they're in class, um, are we doing things to, um, to hold kids accountable? Um, not just relevant, but are we giving them something rigorous? Like last year, it was interesting in our algebra classes, as the year went on, there were kids who had taken it three years and kids who had taken it their first year that were getting A's. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that we would train kids in those classes to be tutors. And when we first had the discussion, some of the teachers said, well, I don't think they can be tutors like the AVID kids because I don't think they have the skills. But we trained those kids who are doing well in the, in the algebra class to be tutors. And that helped the kids who are doing well to be more rigorous, and it helped the kids who are in the class the third time to be taught by someone else other than the teacher and the book. Right. You know, it was, it was, a, it was another way to motivate them. Right. Uh, Paul, what, what, can, what can businesses do to just kind of reinforce that education is important, reinforce that, you know, uh, at both with, with educators, but, you know, with parents? I mean, what can the private sector be doing to say, this is something that's really important, not just for your, your child, but for the overall economy and for their future. Yeah, from the macro to the micro, one business needs to to leverage what it has, which in many cases is funding. Um, what it has is uh, employees, um, and, and bring that to bear um, on our elected officials. Um, it, when California is in an absolute mess when we put more money into prisons than we do into our higher education system, something is wrong. For the Inland Empire, too many of our elected officials, they, they, they win, they go off to Sacramento or Washington, and they forget who they represent. And so business needs to affect them. And then business, and, and, and in, whether you're Riverside or San Bernardino County, whether you're in the Coachella Valley or the West End of San Bernardino County, you need to get involved in some of the really great programs that are being put on. The Alliance for Education, uh, some of the programs that are going on in the Coachella Valley, where we make this connection between education and business. Because so much can happen. It is an educational process for both sides. And, and, and the outcome is to help students see that, uh, to see the long view of their lives. And that is that they're going to need a job. Um, and that they're going to want, to, if they want to live a certain lifestyle, that mm -hmm. means they have to attain a certain salary. And too often those connections aren't made. So business can be a major, major player, but they have to be involved. Right. What, what can parents do? What can, what can schools do to encourage parents to get involved? Jay? Well, I, I think that when we think about a parent population, and their level of understanding of what really they can do to support their children, it varies tremendously. So from a school district perspective, I think a, a great example is um, Corona North Unified School District is beginning to establish a, a web-based interface for parents so they understand what are these really important indicators for their, of their students and what are the things that they can best help their students in learning. Because I don't think it's, you're not going to walk up to a parent or have a parent group and say, what do you want for your child? And have parents saying, well, we don't want our, st our children to be highly educated. We don't want our students to go to college. They're all going to say that. But the challenge is, do they really know what they have to do for their students and how can they support them? I, don't, I just don't think they understand. So if we can create you know, web interfaces and ways in which we create school initiatives that really educate the parents, and then we, we allow them to not feel that there's 87 standards and 30 they're going to do with the seven standards, but say, read to your students, help them write, and, and, you know, and, and do certain things that are easy for you, and your student can be successful. I just don't think parents understand that. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's as much about the education of the parent, but the school really has to be the organization who, who is 
is the uh, connector. Right. Um, and, and I don't think we're exceptionally good at that right now. You know, you know, Su yeah, Susan, what what uh, what can schools? Are there specific things that schools can do to to encourage that parental involvement? Yes, I think one of the things that parents can do is. Each school at Riverside Unified, we have an ABI, a portal, where parents can check their students' grades, their attendance, a lot of different things. At Ramona, we have a digital dashboard because of our initiative on our digital devices where they can go and check their child's work 24-7 and see if they're coming to class. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, call the school, show up at the classroom, do whatever it takes. I think it would be really important to do that. I, I want parents, I, I'd rather have a parent call me with a question. Mm -hmm. I'm excited at high school when a parent calls me, even if it's a problem, mm -hmm. because uh, there's probably another problem I don't know about. In high school, I've been at all three levels, I don't get calls from parents like I do at middle school and elementary school. Right. Janet, you want to jump in with a question? Well, I was going to say one of the hurdles is um, parents who don't have a high level of mm -hmm. education have not gone to college, maybe didn't finish high school. Yes. and and. Is that part of what you're talking about, the education of the parents? Yeah, I, I think the parent doesn't understand the education system, and as a result of that, they aren't really sure as to what they should be looking at to see if their students, and Susan mentioned attributes, what are, the, what are those attributes that are really important to see in my child? And so sometimes there's this thought that the school's going to take care of this for me, um, but if, if a parent realized in elementary school that their child has to be an algebra one and completed by, by ninth grade, that they should be able to have a plan of what they want to uh, accomplish potentially by eighth grade and certain classes that are the A through G classes for community college, for the UC system, Cal State. I'm amazed when sometimes you ask a parent, um, do you know what your student's going to be doing? And they, they have a sense, but do you know what they have to take as far as courses? and they aren't sure. And when you get to 11th grade in a high school, and at that moment, it's a decision point, sometimes the, the information doesn't come to them until 11th grade in high school. So if we can help that parent early as possible, they could at least serve as a stronger driver for their, their students. You know, earlier we talked about making sure kids, even as early as third, fourth, fifth grade, have that foundation. Mm -hmm. But what if they don't? We had a question from, from Twitter that says, you know, what are schools doing to remediate early lagging in reading in third grade, math by fifth grade? I mean, what can be done to help them catch up? So the, the best thing is high quality teachers and a really strong use of formative assessments in the classroom. I, I've seen schools that when you look at data, uh, teachers who have uh, Title I, low um, economic situations, and 80% of their students proficient in language, English language arts. So really, I mean, although we're in a budget crisis, we can't forget that it's the interaction of the classroom with the student and the teacher and helping those teachers really uh, engage in high quality instruction and giving them support to support their students. That's where the magic happens and that's where we have to make sure you know, we spend our time and focus. So right. high quality teachers who have the support they need to support their students. You know, we've talked uh, a lot about kind of it uh, being all doom and gloom with a lot of negative statistics and things like that, but there are school districts across the state, and even here locally, uh, that are having some success stories. You know, Janet, you visited on and uh, reported on Irvine in Orange County and some of the things that they're doing. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on there and some of the, the factors that lead to them having a pretty good, pretty high, you know, 85% um, college-going rate? Well, I, I want to first explain how I ended up in Irvine. Um, the plan was to find a place in the country, anywhere, with a region that had turned around its education system and, as a result, its economy. Couldn't find any. A lot of, a lot of uh, programs are under, underway, but they're just getting started, and there, there wasn't enough to find a place that had actually turned itself around. So we, we looked at Irvine, which really is all about planning. The, the UC Irvine campus was in place well before the city boundaries were established. And the land was owned um, and has been developed by the Irvine Company, which early on realized that housing, education, and jobs were equally important and dependent on each other. 
and that's that's the key. They involve a lot of businesses in the community. They have a very highly educated workforce that draws in businesses, and it's it's a win for everybody. In your reporting, you found that the private sector currently, I mean, they've really stepped up with you know support, both financial and you know what are what's the private sector doing there? Well, millions of dollars are, go to Irvine schools. Uh, they are home to Gateway, Google, Broadcom, a semiconductor maker. Um, and the Irvine Public Schools Foundation doles out millions of dollars that it's raised for programs like music, some of those extracurriculars that improve school success. Mm -hmm. And so they have, they, uh, one of the companies, Broadcom, has a foundation that encourages its employees to volunteer at schools to get involved. Um, it funds the science fair. Um, the district was at risk of losing its science fair because of budget cuts. Broadcom stepped in and uh, like like uh, their spokesperson told me that their their president would rather hire locally within a 10 mile radius of the company than having to right. import its talent right. and that's really what it gets down to. You know Paul let me turn to you. What what can businesses do here in the inland region? Are businesses willing to step up? Maybe not exactly the same way that's it taking place in Irvine, but are inland businesses willing to step up? And, and what can they do, given that many of them are struggling financially sure. as well? I, I think we, the Irvine example plays against who we are. Okay? Um, there are 60 school districts in San Bernardino County and Riverside County. Um, we are 27,000 square miles. Um, we're huge. If we, you know, our economy is bigger than, um, than a lot of states. So we have to realize that that's, that's who we are. Um, what are. One of our biggest deficits and where I think business can help is in the issue of grant funding. And this is the reason why the Inland Empire Economic Partnership has partnered with the Community Foundation serving Riverside and San Bernardino counties there's a disparity in grant funding and part of that is support from 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 companies and and um, and grant funders um, like the Irvine Foundation um, so what am I talking about per capita uh, in California grant funding is hundred and nineteen dollars per person in San Bernardino County it's three three dollars okay in Riverside County it's 51 but if you remove the top grant funders which are specialized in the Coachella Valley it drops to 12 that's $380 million that is not coming to Riverside and San Bernardino counties that could be put into nonprofits working on education issues, on nonprofits working on health care. Um, so we need to tackle that issue, and it, it's going to require that we tackle it um, from the perspective of with business, with educators, and with the nonprofit sector in order to just raise that, that, that number up um, because without it, uh, we are vastly underserved, and yet we have major issues. Um, and, and so somehow we have to take responsibility for this ourselves in order to change it. How do you convince companies that, you know, might not be it, to, to go ahead and invest in, you know, donating money or invest in some foundation support, uh, you know, how do you convince them that you know, they might be looking at their bottom line today how do you convince them that this it would be a wise investment for their, their oh, future? Oh, I think I, I think companies they understand that. Um, if you look at the utilities, uh, the gas company uh, or, or Edison, um, they invest millions and millions of dollars into the community, um, but they do that because they are companies that have a long view. They know that people are always going to need gas and electricity. They know the economy will turn and more homes will be built and that'll be better for their bottom line. So they know that. Where the disconnect comes between businesses giving um, is when they don't see results. Mm -hmm. and, and, and businesses, ultimately, they're result oriented and they, they want to see those results quickly. And if you can prove that to them, if you can prove you're making real change, um, they will support you. Okay. You know, Jay, uh, your company consults and does w with school districts around the state and around the nation. Uh, school districts that are successful in turning themselves around, improving their, their, their academic achievement, improving their graduation rates, do they have 
certain things in common? They do. Um, so I, as I was reading the article uh, Sunday and Monday, it was, I have to say it's, 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 it was wonderful it was put together. Um, I, I think it really talks about the big picture. I think we have to remember, though, it's, it's about systems. And so as we have a tendency to put in certain individual programs, those high-performing districts you're speaking about understand that they're, they're systems. They're integrated systems of student support. So if we take, like, Long Beach Unified School District, for example, they have moved into a model where their idea is seamless educational pathways for all students, going from elementary all the way through college, and how they, as a school district, create systems of support so every student can have a path that's appropriate for them. I think that sometimes we have the flavor of the month, or we have the, what we think is a silver bullet, and we implement it in our school districts, but really we haven't tackled the systems of support for students. And, and how do you change that system? How long does it take? It takes strong leadership from the superintendent down to the teachers, and I think it's, it's as much about a framework. So we work with lots of school districts, and the unfortunate thing is that we tend to want to reinvent the wheel and so we have a process where every school district tries to figure out these systems on their own. Our county offices, so you know, Ken Young out, out of Riverside County Office of Education has really done a great job of trying to create a, a way in which all his school districts might have some common areas of focus. But um, I think it's more so about giving people a framework. We, we use the term integrated system to student support because once people understand what systems they have to put in place, and through like a gap analysis process, then it's, aha, I, I now understand. Because school districts are very busy, they're fragmented, they have huge demands. And it's not that they don't want to, it's that they're pulled in so many directions they may not know how to. Right. You know, uh, before we get into some final questions from, from readers, Susan, I wanted to ask you about Ramona's experiment with technology and putting in place and giving every student a, a seven inch Android uh, tablet computer. Uh, what was the thinking behind that, and have you seen some signs of success with it? Hopefully it's not an experiment. <laughs> it's, a, <clears throat> it's, a, it's, it's part of a, a half a million dollar grant, and it's focused on actually the digital dashboard and enhancing their education and more students going to college. So what it's about is 24-7 learning, that mm -hmm. students can go home at night and they can use this to do their work at night and all of their textbooks are on this device. So uh, a kid can't come to school and say, hey, I forgot my book because all of their books are on there. So teachers are finding interesting ways to extend the learning. I'll give you an example. I was in a French class um, with our teacher and she said, um, I want to remind you to watch the video tonight of conjugating this one verb. You can listen to it over and over until you have it. And then you can take the test, the practice test, three times tonight on your device. And then when you come in class tomorrow, you can take the real test. Well, you can imagine um, if you took French a long time ago, what that would be like, the old homework and then the new homework, how motivating, actually rigorous. And they get to practice it. It's differentiated. So they get to listen to the video, videotape maybe 10 times or maybe one time. Um, so um, we don't have test scores to show you that. Um, and it's only the eighth week of school and so all of the teachers and the students are getting used to it. The, te the students are pushing our learning because they're actually very good at mm -hmm. it and we're learning the different ways to use the device in our learning. But that's just one way. But 24-7 learning so kids can go home and use it and uh, the teachers are learning how to have discussions, uh, to take polls in class, mm -hmm. uh, to actually have, uh, there's an e-clicker on it so they can actually ask a question immediately get all of the answers from the kids in class to know if their instruction is effective and know if they need to go on or if they need to reteach. So right. I think it's different ways of looking at learning using technology as a tool, but the teacher is still the most important part of this equation. Right. So we have some questions from some readers and so anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, we have a, a question from a chemistry, John, a chemistry teacher here in, in Riverside. And one of the things that he kind of talks about is, is actual teaching days and the difference that from 30 years ago to today, he, say, he says, I used to have 170 days of actual teaching. This school year, it is less than 100. Does that amount of time in the classroom uh, translate? And I mean, is, is that important? Are we moving away from, from uh, 
uh, from classroom time? I, I think it's, it's, it's very important. Um, as, as I talked, how to use technology to um, increase the time that kids are away from classroom. I think it's very important to uh, that decrease. That's almost half the time, uh, a little less than that, you know, that we, we need to continue to have those days where the teachers are with students. So I think it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we look at some of the research in California, Marzano is a researcher and he looked at the California standards and he, his research showed that if we were going to have stand, students master all the California standards, K-12, it would only take 23 years. And we don't have students that long. So, so my only response to that very good question is we really have to be, become extremely focused on what is most important for students to master in the classroom, reduce that down, and they provide really engaging opportunities for students that are connected to those career paths and connected to things that students may, may want to become. Um, and so reduction of days obviously has an impact. But, it, it, but then it, deciding on what it is that is most important to teach and how to teach it is probably the only way to overcome a reduction in time. Right. We talked about home environment and parental involvement. We have a question from and a comment from Twitter. It says, I expect teachers to teach. I'm tired of hearing about parental inter the parental intervention gap. <laughs> what about the counselor's role? Parents have, have limits. Uh, I mean, what about when you hear that from, uh, Susan, what about if you, when you hear that from a parent, hey, I have my limits to there's only <coughs> so much that I can do. You guys need to play that role in the classroom. Well, I, I have always seen parents as partners with their, and especially in high school, parents and the student and the teacher and myself as partners. We, we all, the kids have to see that we are all connected and that whatever we're asking for them to do, that they're going to back us up and work with us. You know, if kids need to get to class on time, if the t kid needs to get to tutoring, that we're all on the same. And I need the parent sitting next to me with the student saying with the same message. So I see us as partners. They didn't just drop them off at high school and say, now they're yours, because that's never going to work. We, we've got to continue, obviously, through college we, and in the community, into the workforce. We all have to be partners. Mm -hmm. We have, an, we have another question from Patty that from email says, I volunteered all through K through 8. Once children get to middle school, the only help school seems, seems to want is the extra body for field trips or fundraising. In high school, it is fundraising or sports booster clubs. While I understand these are important, what can a parent do to become more involved at this level? What can parents do to get more involved in, in, their, in, in at the high school level right, that's beyond, say, sports or extracurricular activities? So Susan probably can answer this better than I, but I, I think that if you look at some high schools and, and the culture they have, some schools when they become all about ensuring all students prepare for college and ready for a career, then they change the way in which they want to engage the community and the parents with the school and the purpose. So if what we celebrate are athletic events and, and, and certain types of activities, then that's the reason why parents come. If we change what we celebrate and we change what we give recognition for, then we change how it is we want students to inter interact with us. So, but again, it comes down to what type of a culture we want our school to have. And I think Susan's doing lots of things along those lines. Th this next question um, has to do with, and it's from James and it's via email. It says, how can we forge more and stronger partnerships between formal and informal education programs in order to share resources and op opportunities that are vital to each? I mean, uh, in formal informal education programs, it might be able to extend out to, Paul, to, to businesses. What can, I mean, who wants to, to tackle well, that? It, it, it's all of us. It's all of us. So I think that's, you know, it's the work that I do every day is trying to bring together business and the public sector, um, our educational institutions and the nonprofits in, in order for us to see that um, unless we all work on the issues, we're not going to be able to move the ball. Um, I applaud the, the Press Enterprise for, uh, for doing uh, the special uh, edition. And you know, even if you just, you don't think it impacts you, Go back to yesterday's press enterprise. Look at the, the diagram about talked about if half of the 27,000 dropouts follow the money, right? It impacts all of us. And we could have a much better quality of life. Uh, we, we could have a, a higher standard of living if we would all get involved. 
And so I, I think uh, going back to business, business needs to be involved. They need to volunteer. Uh, they need to, to provide funding. Um, our, our public institutions need to work together. Mm -hmm. um, educators need to be willing to, to, to reach out uh, to others um, and, and help share the experience of educating our, our children. And the issue of the parents, if you're not going to be a parent, then don't do it, right? But that's that's forever, and so you just can't say, well, I'm going to give it to the educators. Educators can do what they can, but at the end of the day, it is the parent that needs to, to watch after the child. Because in elementary school, the elementary school educators want the student to get out of elementary school. The high school educators want them to get out of, uh, out of the uh, high school and, 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 and well prepared, right? But the parent is the one that has to guide continually um, in the process. Right. So, uh, a, a question also came in from about business from, from Twitter. It says, with core school funding in crisis, is it not unrealistic to look to business for money? I mean, what can the uh, private sector uh, you know, really do? Well, again, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a limit to what they can do. Um, and some of them are better positioned to support than others. I go back to the political, uh, the political issues. These need to be dealt with. Um, right now, in the state of California, because the budget uh, projections are under what was, uh, what was uh, said to happen, we're looking at another major round of cuts to the UC system, another major round of cuts to the Cal State system, and if that continues, the next that are going to be hit are the school districts. And how are they going to do that? By going back to one of the things we were just talking about, and that's by cutting back school days. What sense does that make? And look again at the, at the world economy and, and the role that we should play because we are located in a, in a place that makes us a bridge between Asia and the rest of the country, and yet throughout the rest of the world, um, days are being increased for schools. Um, hours of, of the days are being increased, and yet we're stuck in this stupidity, which is only undermining uh, everything that, 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 that we're trying, what we're talking about. Right. And, or, and, and, yeah, I don't, and I don't think it's all about money. I think that if 10 of my students could intern for very little at a, at a business that's right down the street from the school mm -hmm. and have somebody somewhere they go and they learn some soft skills of working with other people and they learn that and that's motivating to them and they get out of, of, their, of their life. You know how great that is for ten students, and I find another business for three students, and I find another business. You know that's really changing the culture of my school. Absolutely, and that would be an exciting thing. Yeah. You know we're about out of time, but I want to each have you. You know, is there one thing as we close? Is there one thing that you would want? You know, business leaders, community leaders, elected officials, parents, other educators. Uh, to, to instill in them about the importance of education in Riverside and San Bernardino counties, what, what would it be? Just you know, a brief, brief comment. Susan? Well, I, I want to thank the Press Enterprise, Press Enterprise for having this conversation. I think it's really important, and I appreciate us um, looking at not for blame, but for some solutions and some models. And I hope that this is not the last time that there's a discussion or there's an article in the newspaper that you continue to do this and that we keep this open dialogue and that we come back to our schools and that we have some accountability for ourselves with this discussion. And I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Jay. So I, I, th I think that it. The perfect storm is happening in education and in business, and, and Paul's talked about that. If school districts can begin to take more of a community of practice approach, and instead of having it so that we sometimes function as separate islands, if we begin to look at what are those best practices and what are those systems that, that we are seeing success in, and have the ability to understand how to do that with side of our own school culture, then the likelihood of accelerating student learning is pretty high. So ways in which we convene, share, and promote best practices and help others learn from each other across regions, you know, is it, vital. It's so important. Mm -hmm. And Paul? On behalf of the Inland Empire Economic Partnership and the people who make up the partnership, I want to uh, applaud the Press Enterprise for raising um, the issue, um, for, for putting so much time and talent in, in, into this. Because I think the answer to the question is, 
if you live in the Inland Empire, Riverside and San Bernardino counties, if you're one of the 4.3 million people, you have to care about education because it impacts our quality of life. And the only way we're ever going to change things is by working on the, the issue together. Right. Well, we thank all of you for being here. Paul Granillo with uh, Inland Empire Economic Partnership, Jay Westover with Innovate Ed, and Susan Mills from Ram Principal at Ramona High. We thank you all for taking an hour out of your day this morning to talk with us about the importance of education here in Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And we thank all of you for watching and for sending in your questions via email and Twitter. For the Press Enterprise and PE.com, I'm Dwayne Gang. Thanks for watching.